Hi everyone and thanks for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Tom Pritchard and in a minute I'll be introducing you to our speaker today who is Professor Matthew Gilbert. Um, the webinar is modelling railway bridges using limit state ring and in the webinar we're discussing how you can model uh, railway arch bridge loading and common features using limit state ring and then this will be interspersed with some practical examples using the software. The presentation itself will run for around 45 minutes and will include a little time at the end for questions which can be posted at any time by the question box that should be present in your webinar interface. We will try to get through as many of the questions as we can in the time available but this isn't always possible but we do try to make sure that we respond to any unanswered questions via email after the webinar is finished. Uh, for people who have questions outside of the webinar, um, please just get in contact with us via info at limitstate.com and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have in detail for you. Um, so shortly I'll just be uh, handing you over to our speaker for today who is Professor Matthew Gilbert, the Limit State Ring Product Manager. Thanks very much Tom and uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today and once again apologies for the uh, delay in the, the start of the webinar due to uh, some technical difficulties we had at, at, at our end. Okay so um, focus of the work is on um, um, railway bridges um, and particularly uh, clearly masonry arch railway bridges because we're using the limit state ring um, software. So what I'll do is um, just say a few words about the company, a bit of um, um, introduction to the, um, the topic, then move on to focus on railway loading uh, and then finally how we uh, can apply the limit state ring software to masonry arch bridges and then finally wrap up with some conclusions. Okay, so um, just um, um, say a few words about Limit State. Um, it was spun out from Sheffield in 2006, um, focusing on commercializing academic research, providing engineers with uh, software that what wasn't available in the in, in the marketplace at the time um, that can very quickly and simply. Um, analyze the ultimate limit state and what we use is optimization technology um, that's been developed at the University of Sheffield. Uh, because we're a spin-out company we're able to spend all our time focusing on making sure the software is easy to use and uh, fully supported. So just a quick bit of introduction, many of you have seen this before, um, this is the kind of uh, view of, of traditional tools in the engineering analysis um, sector. So for calculating the, the ultimate limit state, we typically can either do hand type calculations or automated hand calculations. Um, or at the other extreme, we can um, apply things like nonlinear finite elements, discrete elements and so forth to do the same job. However, there's a large gap between those two types of tool and our um, focus has been on filling that gap and filling that gap for a variety of different applications so geotechnical applications, masonry arch bridge applications which is clearly the focus of today and uh, also um, slab analysis, concrete slab analysis. Um, we've got a, a, a method of systematically automating the, the yield line method which previously was a hand analysis tool. So those are the uh, the three tools that are uh, um, available at the present time. Let me say ring, geo and slab for bridges, mystery bridges, geotechnical applications and slab applications. And those tools are now widely used in, in, in many countries worldwide. I'll just give you a quick flavour of the kinds of companies that are using it. This is uh, an A to Z of existing cu customers from a, a year or two ago. So you can see some big names in there, Acom, Amy, Arup, Atkins, and, and so on. Okay, so a bit of background. Um, Mason Arch bridges uh, are all around us. In terms of railways, there are very large numbers of bridges um, carrying railway loading in many countries in the world. In the UK, around 25,000 underbridge rail spans are in service. The vast majority of them are well over 100 years old now and they need to be regularly assessed quite clearly. 
Um, what I'm going to do is do what I often do is, is just dive into uh, how they work and the most useful um, piece of work was uh, can be attributed to Robert Hooke in 1675. He made an observation that as hangs a weightless chain, Serbus inverted stands the masonry arch. It's a really, really simple but really, really useful way of viewing how masonry arch bridges work. So the inverted um, profile of the, the weightless chain, which was used to, to effectively hang all these voussoirs, is now superposed on um, a masonry arch. That's called the line of thrust. And we can see that there are many potential lines of thrust um, that fit entirely within the masonry. However, um, at the ultimate limit state, there is a limiting line of thrust. Um, so we get to a point where we can only just fit that line of thrust within the masonry, and hence we have a, a unique um, indication of um, the amount of load required to cause um, failure of, of the structure. And uh, at that point, the, the structure will um, transform into a, a mechanism, and you can see here for a single span bridge that we have four hinges um, at collapse. So just say a few words about uh, uh, about that, what it tells us. The key takeaway is probably number one, the shape of the arch in relation to the applied loading governs the stability of a masonry arch bridge. And that's something that you always need to remember when you're dealing with masonry arch bridges. It means that you should be careful um, when you um, survey a bridge. You need to um, have a good um, indication of the, the geometry of the structure. But equally, uh, it's worth knowing exactly what the pattern of loading is on the on the bridge. So those two together govern the stability. And the example I'm going to use later on is going to um, hopefully underline that that point. However. Um, just considering a bare um, arch barrel is clearly a simplification of what we have in a, in, in a real bridge. Um, fill material acts to um, pre-stress the, the structure, provides dead weight, vertical dead weight, um, which provides uh, additional um, reserves of, of strength. The load that's applied to the structure is dispersed, so by the time it hits the barrel, it will um, have a longer loaded length than the, um, the original axle. And also, um, there is potentially soil surrounding the, the arch, which will uh, provide passive restraint to movement of the, the structure. Um, the third point um, relates to how we typically assess masonry arch bridges at the present time. Typically, we focus on the ultimate limit state, and we um, assume that um, if we have sufficient margins of safety on the ultimate limit state, then the serviceability limit state will be um, implicitly satisfied. And it's work um, in this area to try and um, uh, make this uh, a little bit more refined, but at the present time, that's how we typically assess masonry arch bridges. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, before I get into um, how the software actually works, I'm just going to quickly show you how the um, the software can be used when it comes to railway masonry arch bridges. So what I'm going to do is use what's called the, the new bridge wizard. Um, and the very first page that's displayed allows you to choose whether you're dealing with a highway bridge or a wet railway underline bridge. So what I'm going to do is select railway underline and um, proceed from, from, from that point. Um, there are other uh, um, boxes that you can, you can um, enter text in just to describe where the bridge is, but also you can um, choose whether or not the effective width is manually specified or whether it's automatically computed. So there are, um, there is the option to actually um, take into account code of practice uh, values for transverse distribution of the load through the fill, etc. 
um, and allow the software to um, calculate the effective width automatically. Um, for now, I'm just going to keep it um, at, a, at a fixed value for simplicity, but um, you can always uh, choose um, that automatic setting if it's appropriate for your needs. Um, then move on to the, the geometry. Um, we can specify um, the end abutments. Um, however, these are designed for when you have an end standing pier, for example, a girder span. Um, when you have a normal situation with an embankment uh, behind a, a bridge, then the normal um, assumption is that these, these abutments are fixed, so there's no need to model them explicitly. We then move on to um, the, the span, and we're given various different options as to the shape of the span. So is this a segmental shape, or, or do we have survey points? Generally speaking, um, strongly recommend that you use survey points and use one of these user-defined shapes um, where you have that uh, um, data available. We can also uh, choose um, what type of um, masonry arch barrel we're working with. So is it a stone voussoir, a, a bonded brick, or a multi-ring brick um, arch barrel? Um, if it's the latter, then it's assumed that those rings effectively uh, work independently with just friction um, between them, and you can um, look at the, um, the modes of response of a bridge in, in, in that condition. Uh, for now, however, I'm just going to keep this simple, and I'm going to keep it as a single span, so I'm not going to add an additional span. Um, move on to uh, the fill profile. We can specify um, backfill height, and also we can um, specify uh, a surface fill depth, which in the case of a, a rower bridge uh, corresponds to the ballast um, and uh, sort of sleeper region. Partial factors. Um, at the moment, they're all unity, but you can enter the, the parameters that are applicable to the assessment code that you are working with. Um, so you can specify different factors on um, track load, axle load, dynamic factor, and so forth in this section. But for now, I'm just going to keep things simple again and keep those as unity. Move on to um, the masonry. Um, various things are possible. We can um, specify different values for... Um, piers and spans if we had a multi-span structure. Uh, for now, however, I'm just going to keep things simple and use the default values um, for the unit weight and for the compressive strength and also for the, the coefficient of um, friction. So limit state ring allows a wide variety of different failure modes to be modeled, including both hinging, sliding, and, and combined failure mechanism, which is why it's asking for a, a friction coefficient. Move on to, to, to backfill, enter details of the unit weight, angle of friction, and cohesion, and also just confirm that we're modeling um, the various effects of the backfill that we would expect to be present, so that's dispersion of the live load through the fill, and modeling passive restraint, so I'll keep those. And then finally, we get on to something that's relevant to uh, a railway underlying bridge. Um, we have um, the option to, to enter details of the, the sleepers, the spacing between the sleepers, and also um, the superimposed track load as well. So that allows us to um, differentiate um, the bridge um, from a highway bridge and actually enter the, uh, the rail-specific properties. We're also able to... Um, specify the unit weight of the, of the material and the angle of dispersion of the, the load through the fill. And we'll come back to this, exactly how it works uh, in the slides uh, shortly. And then uh, final um, dialogue on the new bridge wizard is the loads dialogue. And if I click on the vehicle database, then you can see that we have um, some railway vehicles 
um, available to select from and we can also um, uh, store our own vehicles uh, in here so um, we have um, for example um, a HTA HTA wagons and HA wagons which actually I'm going to come back to a little bit later there are specific um, vehicle type or axle uh, sorry wagon type in this case that I can use um, what I'm going to do now is just uh, choose uh, for example um, uh, a network rail RA1 short length and I can then choose that in my problem click finish and I have a, a bridge with a load. Now actually probably for railway loading this is uh, a little bit insubstantial so I'm just going to increase the um, the width to a more um, usual um, thickness uh, for a railway mismatch bridge. If I move the, um, the load on the bridge I can instantly um, get um, a failure, a predicted failure mechanism and a predicted adequacy factor. The adequacy factor is the multiplier on the applied loading that's been specified. And what I can do is um, move the, the load around manually and see how sensitive um, the, the, the bridge is to the position of this load. In this case, uh, probably the the adequacy factor is about 3.2 in this case, and um, it's most critical when the, the load is around the sort of quarter span point. When I have a load nearer the, the mid span, then the adequacy factor, if you can see, goes up significantly from just above 3 to 7.8. What we can also see is um, that the blue line has got thicker in this case. The blue line is actually a thrust zone and that indicates the amount of masonry, the thickness of masonry effectively to carry the particular um, thrust at that location. And so if we if you have lower um, more, um, adequacy factors and more critical positions then you can see that actually the, the force in the in the masonry arch is actually lower as you'd expect. We can also see that we have um, um, dispersion of the um, the load. I can probably um, can see this. We've actually got a vehicle um, and underneath, directly underneath each axle we actually have three loads and that's because of the standard uh, assumption when we're dealing with railway loading that we have um, dispersion under uh, a sleeper directly underneath the axle and then in also underneath the, the two adjacent uh, sleepers as well but we'll come to that shortly. So that gives you a kind of a, a quick idea about what we're talking about when it comes to limit state ring if you're not familiar. The question you might be asking if you're not familiar is how do we find a collapse load? Well, of all the permissible equilibrium states, which we can visualize as lines of thrust fitting within the masonry, of all those possibilities, we use optimization to find the one corresponding to the maximum load factor. And that also um, corresponds to the point at which uh, we can only just fit the, the thrust line or thrust zone within the masonry and also simultaneously we have the uh, formation of a collapse mechanism. In terms of the, the mathematics, I won't, I won't dwell on this slide, uh, it boils down to uh, a linear optimization problem where we uh, satisfy equilibrium and yield constraints and uh, find this maximum um, load factor. It's a very simple problem and it's a problem that allows us to um, identify the critical murder response, however complex that is. In other words, it's general and it could involve um, hinging, sliding, etc., or, 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 or crushing even. So for a railway bridge, 
Um, what we're doing is um, applying a loading vehicle. That load is dispersed through the fill onto the masonry. We have um, the predicted mechanism, so hinges shown in red, the thrust line or thrust zone in blue. We also are mobilizing surrounding soil um, and we have so-called backfill elements mobilizing in blue here on the left-hand side of the, uh, the slide and, um, and inactive um, backfill elements on the right-hand side. So in other words, the arch is moving into the, the soil on the left-hand side, but it's moving away from the soil on the right-hand side, so we don't have mobilization. In terms of the entities, we've got blocks, and then between those blocks, we have contacts. And so that basically sums up uh, what we're dealing with in, in an analysis. Um, the big differentiator between a highway bridge and a railway bridge is, is the loading. Um, what we have in Limit State Ring, um, as we've also already briefly touched on is uh, a track sleeper ballast distribution model and we've also got a range of, of standard railway vehicles built in. So the distribution model um, is shown on the slide you can see now. So what we have is um, a series of axles typically and under each axle we assume half a load from the axle um, is transmitted onto the, the sleeper directly underneath, and then a quarter of the load goes to the adjacent sleepers. Now, until recently, um, I had no uh, evidence that this was a, a suitable model for masonry arch bridges. However, in the last uh, year or two, we've actually been able to do some tests in the laboratory uh, where we've actually had um, sleepers and, 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 and railway uh, track and albeit for a relatively limited number of tests, we found um, that this model uh, is, is reasonably good. It's a little bit conservative, but reasonably um, uh, reliable um, as far as uh, the limited number of tests that we've carried out is concerned anyway. Um, in terms of uh, what happens below the sleeper level, then we have dispersion through the, um, the surface fill, which is ballast in the case of a railway, uh, most commonly. And then we can have um, a different angle of dispersion through the, um, the backfill below. And uh, these are the default spread angles. Actually, Limit State Ring was developed in conjunction with the, the International Union of Railways, or UIC for short, and these were the values that that they recommended that we used um, as the default parameters. However, um, quite clearly, um, many uh, well assessment codes will have uh, different values, and you should uh, use the the values that you uh, you think are appropriate for the uh, the context in which you're working in. Similarly, um, transverse distribution. Um, if we if we want to use the automatic um, calculation of bridge width functionality, then we specify um, transverse angles of dispersion and an effective width will be um, automatically um, calculated. Um, however, you need to be careful that uh, you're aware that um, um, there are differences um, in, in practice from that. So if you have um, um, cracks, longitudinal cracks in your bridge, then clearly it's unsafe to use the automatic effective width. So in this case, you would actually specify the effective width normally. Um, also, when you're near the edge of a bridge, then you may need to uh, um, adjust the, the effective width accordingly. In terms of load models, um, the UIC favored model is load model 71, um, which is a series of 20, 250 kN axles with uh, leading and trailing UDL. So just to point out that we, we do include 
this model, but we um, we don't include the the leading and trailing UDL because most often with um, mesh match bridges um, that UDL is is uh, is beneficial. So it's actually better to have the axial loadings um, alone. Um, and if you want to have a either a training or a leading um, UDL, you can add that separately. But having both together is, is normally not critical. Also, um, we include network rail type RA1 loading. So this is um, a particular configuration of axles, actually dating back, I believe, to uh, a 1926 steam locomotive, I believe, um, but we have this, and uh, again, the uh, the trailing UDL um, by default is is not including not included, and there was a, a standard um, full implementation of that, but also you can have a a, a, a shorter uh, or short length version of that type of loading as well, which is included. Um, so this just shows you the software um, in the vehicle database area with the, um, um, in this case, the um, the RA1 full um, load train um, there identified. And you can see that that gives rise to many, many effective uh, um, loadings because each axle is split into three sort of mini axles, if you like, or uh, free loading, certainly below the, the adjoining sleepers. Um, we've already looked at the track ballast properties. Um, one of the things we haven't uh, focused on specifically is um, the dynamic factor. Um, in UK practice, um, it's common to specify a dynamic factor which is only applied to one axle in your um, applied loading vehicle. So it's possible to do that, to specify the, the axle um, factor, and then to choose which um, axle that factor is applied to. And we'll actually apply that uh, in the example shortly. Um, other loading effects, um, other vertical effects can be modeled, so centrifugal effects and so forth. Um, Horizontal forces are currently not easy to model, um, partly because of the, the indirect model of the backfill that we adopt in limit state ring. So it's it's um, it's, it's difficult to um, um, to justify the quite simplistic um, or simplified soil model that we use um, in the presence of horizontal loads, and we haven't done the laboratory testing to to verify. Um, that any model that we might propose is actually doing the right thing. So at the moment, we don't uh, allow that to be included. OK, so um, moving on then to um, a practical application of the, the software. Um, here we've got a, a multi-span wear-away bridge um, subject to um, heavy freight loading. Um, so this particular bridge has got a series of 50 meter spans. Looks uh, very picturesque. This is actually in the, the southwest of Scotland in the UK. However, if you look closely at the bridge, there are some significant um, problems. So the, um, the spandrel wall has become detached from the surrounding um, masonry of the barrel and the key thing is that this appeared to happen quite abruptly following a change in the um, the loads that were applied so whereas previously we had a particular wagon used um, short wheelbase wagon um, used to carry the freight after the change, we had much longer wheelbase wagons and a slight, that's 8% increase in axle loading. And that caused this and, and a number of other bridges in the same area to be um, badly affected, so suddenly to deteriorate. 
So these are the the old and the new wagons that were um, that are relevant to this particular structure. So originally we had these short wheelbase wagons, um, two axles per wagon, and we moved to much longer wheelbase wagons with um, four axles per wagon. So the question is, could we have predicted in this case that the wagon type um, change would cause a problem? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the, the software. Um, I'm going to um, I'm not going to um, create an exact replica of the bridge. I'm just going to use um, um, approximate values just so I can enter these uh, uh, live in the webinar without having to uh, enter many, many user-defined values. So back to the new bridge, bridge wizard. New bridge wizard, if I can say it again. So first thing is that we choose highway. Sorry, railway. Um, for now, I'm going to keep the effective width as the default value, but we may want to look at that later. If I move through the wizard, I'm not going to change the abutment. I'm going to enter details of the span, so 15 meters thereabouts, and it's approximately um, semicircular, so I'm going to be happy using the segmental shape. Again, if I had more time, I would um, enter a user-defined shape with all the different um, x, y values. The ring thickness is about 900 millimeters. So this one is a multi-span. I'm actually going to model two spans for simplicity rather than all four, but I, you could just as easily model all four if you had the time. So insert span after this. Um, I then move on to a, a, a dialog I haven't seen before. This is the peer dialog. Um, I'm going to enter the height of this pier to be 12 meters, thickness at the top 2,300 millimeters, thickness at the base 2,400. So these are approximate properties um, that broadly reflect um, the geometry of the bridge that I showed earlier. If I click next, I then move on to span two, and what you can see is conveniently the properties are exactly the same as I entered for span one. So I'm happy with that in this case, and I can move on um, to the fill profile. Um, I'm going to enter a Y value of 8,400, and I'm going to keep the default um, surface fill depth for um, ballast depth in this case of 500. Um, Move on to partial factors. In this case, uh, it's a UK railway bridge. So I'm going to enter um, an axle load that's, that's relevant to UK scenario, axle load factor of 1.9 and a dynamic factor of 1.8. I'm going to keep the others as unity. For the masonry, clearly um, the scope to enter particular um, properties that correspond to the bridge that we're, we're looking at. Um, I'm going to keep things as default for now, however, to keep things simple. And the same for the backfill and also for the, the track ballast. I'm just going to keep the default properties um, for now. Which brings me on to the, the last dialog and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the vehicle database and I'm going to go to um, actually use a defined section and I've actually specified um, the geometries of the wagons that I showed on the slide earlier. So I'm going to import both of these wagons into my project so that they're available for use. And I'm going to change it to, for example, the HAA wagon uh, case for now and click finish. So what I have then is the geometry and the HAA wagon. 
And what I can do is I can manually move this around, this load around, um, to, to, to get a feel for where the critical location of this vehicle is. Um, what I can also do, and I've certainly um, done it in other webinars, is I can use the automatic um, uh, capabilities where you run the vehicle across the bridge. But this is quite simple, so I'm not going to actually bother. I'm just going to probe roughly where the, the critical position is and get a value for the adequacy factor. And it's looking like it's around 2.1 for the adequacy factor. So, um, and it's going to be critical when all of this loading from, in this case, three of these wagons adjacent to each other. So this could be the trailing um, end of a train um, applied to the, um, the bridge. So we've got a factor of 2.1 for the adequacy factor here. Now, what I'm going to do is just flip this now to the HTA wagons and see whether or not I get something similar. So you can see now we have a very different um, configuration of axles. So once again, I can move the, um, the vehicle around. And what you can see is actually straight away I have a much lower adequacy factor. So I'm down at about 1.3 now. And um, actually the, the worst case scenario in this case is when we have the um, a set of axles um, on um, span 2 and then the, the, a, a large uh, concentration of axles on span 1. So, so let's just see, this needs to be a bit further for this to be most critical. So we're getting there. So this is around the critical point. So we can see, whereas I had an adequacy factor of 1.3 for the, sorry, 2.1 for the, the previous vehicle, I've now got 1.3 for this vehicle, which is, which is a lot lower. And this is without actually applying the dynamic factor because if we go back to the um, um, the load case tab, I actually haven't yet assigned the um, dynamic factor to any any of the axles. So what I can do is I can actually have a look at this and I can see that it's likely that having a larger load on, for example, axle one, two, three, four, five, say, is going to probably be most critical. Obviously, you can do this in your ledger and, and try different combinations. But if I do that and then solve again, you can see actually we've now got an adequacy factor of 0.96. So it's actually below 1. So that's telling me that this uh, um, bridge is, is, is struggling to, to carry this load, certainly with that effective width. So what it's likely to do in practice is it's likely to to try to use more of the width of the bridge in order to resist the loading, and that leads in turn onto the the kind of problems that you saw in practice where you have cracks be below the uh, uh, the spandrel wall. Um, just one final thing before I I, I go back to the slides. Um, um, I've used the the software at the moment in 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 the um, sort of simple mode, but you can, um, once you start to know more details of the bridge, enter uh, details of, um, for example, mortar loss, um, different types of masonry with different unit weights and so forth. So for example, let's suppose this bridge uh, was um, crossing a river and there was some, some mortar loss um, in, the, in the base of the pier, I can um, enter the details of that. If I select those contacts, and if you can see, I can put mortar loss of say 100 millimeters in there. If we zoom in, we can see that mortar loss now. Hopefully, and if we click solve, we can see that the the thrust line, thrust line can can no longer go right to the edge, 
and we have a reduction in the adequacy factor from 9.6 to 0.93. So as well as using the software in the mode I've just done, we can also um, use the uh, software to directly input um, the kinds of uh, defects, etc., that you might see in practice. And the other thing to know is this is a multi-span bridge. Um, it's able to identify multi-span failure modes directly. You, there's no need to um, to manually balance thrusts in in the pier, for example, uh, which which you have to do with some some tools. So, going back to my question, could we have predicted that this change in wagon type would cause problems? The answer is yes. If we had have been uh, using real loads in the analysis, then it's, it's clear that, that the new wagon type is significantly more onerous. If we look at the, the, the initial case that we, we ran where there was no dynamic factor applied, we were moving from an average factor of 2.1 down to 1.3. So an 8% increase in axle loads, but a massively bigger um, reduction in, in, in adequacy factor because the pattern of loading has been changed. So just to wrap up then, um, limit state ring allows railway loading to be to be modelled, um, including track ballast load spreading on, on, um, through the track, etc. We can model both single and multi-span bridges directly. And finally, touch on it very, very briefly, many of the defects found in bridges and field can be modelled directly. Okay, so that concludes my bit. I'm just going to pass back to Tom, who's going to um, just uh, wrap things up. Cheers. Thanks, Matthew. Um, given that we start a little bit late, what we'll do is have a very quick look at the questions and see if there are any that uh, we've got time to answer, but um, I shall have a look now. And uh, we can have a look. Okay, so we've got a few on whether you can automatically actually, yeah. Um, so Matthew described in the presentation about moving the loads left and right manually, and also asked whether you can automatically run the loads over the bridge, and I think if sharp-eyed amongst you will have been able to see that if you come into the loading database here, um, there's a thing that says add load cases, and what you can do is you can click that to then set up a number of different load cases that will move from one side of the bridge to the other. So in this case, if I just cancel that and move the load over to the left here, actually it's automatically solved that one, but I can add load cases and say, okay, target my load case one, I'll put in 15 copies of it at 300 mil spacing. That might not actually get all the way across the bridge, but it will give us an idea of what's going on. So if I just click go, and it goes through each of these load cases and yeah, in this case it hasn't gotten that far across the bridge because it's quite a large span but we can see that we're automatically going through at this um, regular spacing and identifying which the critical load cases so it's saying here that the critical load case in this case was 16 out of 16. Um, yeah, given that we're running over time, I think it's probably um, best if we wrap up now. We would, we do have some other questions which we'll get around to answering by email to those people uh, specifically. Uh, but I'd just like to thank Matthew for the presentation and thanks to everyone for attending. Again, apologies for the audio difficulties at the beginning. Um, but we do hope that you found the webinar informative. And if it has prompted any other questions, please do get in touch with us via telephone or you can email us on info at limitstate.com and we'll be very happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, for people that aren't current users of the software, we'll be in touch just to get some feedback, find out if you have any other questions and also whether you think Limit State Ring might be useful for you. And if you'd like to watch the webinar again or if you know anybody that might be interested to see it, there'll be a recording available um, within the next day or so on our YouTube channel and we'll send you an email with a link to it once that's available. And finally, please do look out for the event notifications that will be sent out by email 
uh, I'm posted on our website, uh, which is www.limitsate.com slash events, and that will give you more information about upcoming webinars and events, um, specifically ones to do with Limit State Ring. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you all for listening, and I hope that you can join us again in the near future. Goodbye.